Bueno, vamos a seguir el debate ahora sobre el, las condiciones legales, digamos, el marco legal eh, en Europa con respecto a la migración. Y es un gran placer poder presentarles tres eminentes expositores. Mr. Mohamed Aziz, director of the Aziz Foundation and fellow at Faiths and Civil Society Unit at the University of London. He's been an advisor for the European Union, for the United Kingdom, and he's participated in commissions of uh, racial equality, the Commission of uh, Equality and Human Rights, and other commissions. And he's also uh, directed several research um, projects in the University of Cambridge. I'll also introduce you to Mrs. Nesrin El Alahaf uh, with a degree in journalism and uh, law by the University Carlos III in Madrid. She belongs to the uh, Guild of Lawyers of Madrid and she's part of the Observatory of Justice since 2010 as an expert in foreign affairs. She is also active in different institutions and forums like the um, Hispanic um, um, Moroccan uh, Forum, and she is also a member of different uh, Moroccan Hispanic institutions. I'll also introduce you to Mr. Wellman uh, with a doctor, Mr. Stefan Hink, Hofer Salskai from the University of Graz in Austria. And from 2001 to 2014, he's been an associate researcher in Austria uh, on public law, and he's also participated in the Max Planck Institute and, and in the uh, Institute of Heidelberg in Germany. Amongst other things, Professor Hinghover Salski is working on the uh, publication of a manual, which will be published next year, on the uh, legal uh, frameworks related to the Islam in Europe. Sorry, in Austria, in Austria, not in Europe. So the manual will be related to the situation in Austria, but we know that uh, the other countries are uh, making similar efforts. So with our further ado, we can start with a discussion from the presentation of Mr. Mohamed Aziz. Mohamed Aziz, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I must first apologize to the interpreters because I'm naturally quite a fast speaker, so I'll try and slow down as much as I can, but right from the start, I'm sorry if I go a little bit fast. Please slow me down, um, including the chair, if, I, if you feel I'm going too fast. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of comments uh, from uh, the last session. Um, there was a, a standing joke when I was in... Um, working in government in Whitehall, um, advising uh, some of the cabinet ministers uh, on various aspects of race, uh, religion, and cohesion. Um, <clears throat> that uh, now the, the niceties and simplistic messages of the politicians uh, and media uh, is done. Let's get down to the real business. Um, I'm sorry if the politicians are still in here. I don't mean to offend you. But I think the real stuff here is actually quite complex and quite messy. Um, and uh, it doesn't quite lend to the uh, easier political and uh, media headlines. Um, so in view of this, I'd like to make two comments about this first session. First, that integration really is a two-way process, and I think we need to understand this. Um, I feel a little bit uneasy when people start making any connotations about the superiority of one set of values, whether it's European values or any other values, um, as compared to other values, whether it's Islamic Muslim values or Indian values or Chinese values. Um, so any suggestion doesn't sit well. Um, I think, I mean, my own feeling is that we have a wonderful set of values which we worked out after the horrors of the Second World War, where millions and millions of people were killed. And those are encapsulated in international law, international human rights, 
uh, and the values that underpin international law and international human rights. And they're articulated in international human rights instruments and uh, you know, wonderfully in the European Convention of Human Rights. And it's the duty of long-standing populations in Europe as well as newly arrived populations to respect and obey uh, those values, to live by those values. And I say this because we've had a lot of discourse over the last 10, 15, 20 years in the UK about what British values are. And we've come to the conclusion that it's not about fish and chips and uh, lager and hooliganism. That's not what it's about. Um, it's about what we might call freedom values, freedom or fairness, rights, respect, equality, dignity, autonomy of the individual. It's about equality, it's about the rule of law, it's about democracy. And those are not uniquely British values, those are not uniquely European values. Those are values we cherish to as an international community and that we've tried to enshrine in those documents um, that I've just mentioned. And yes, of course, we must remember and celebrate our unique histories in Europe, but let us also celebrate the diversity that we have recently found in European societies. I said to somebody that I was gonna be provocative. We might think of what our values are. I mean, when we ask what British values are, it's actually quite difficult to come down to anything which is uniquely British. And I was saying to somebody this morning, that as somebody who worked on gender equality for a very long time, you know, the fact that we started off with four men and that some of the men disappeared before the first woman spoke, that's not a British value, that's not a European value. Those are all things, and I can understand that that's, you know, it's nobody intended that, it just happened that way. All of those things are absolutely right. But actually, when you go down to what real values are, you realize that those are not owned by any specific community or any specific geography. The second thing that I wanted to mention is about terrorism. Of course terrorism is a problem um, in, in Britain, in Europe. But let's not kid ourselves, it's not just arrived on our shores. Um, it's not geographically located in origin ideationally located or located by religion. It has no religion. There is also a thing called homegrown terrorism. The way we've dealt with terrorism in the UK, particularly with regards to terrorism from Muslim communities, is as though it's just arrived on our shores. We've completely forgotten that we've had 100 years of dealing with terrorism with the IRA, and we started again. It's as though it's a new thing. It's not a new thing. I think it's important that we don't overstate the problem. I think it's important that we understand the root causes of the problem. I don't think we do understand the root causes of the problem. I don't think we understand the psychology of children and the psychology of children with regards to identity and identity formation and how that plays into terrorism. I don't think we understand how poverty and inequalities plays into terrorism. I don't think we understand how foreign policy plays into terrorism. I don't think we understand all of those things. And I certainly don't think we understand the weight of each of these things against the others in terms of how terrorism knocks on our door. Um, of course, there may be a religious element to terrorism, but let's not think that it's the only element to terrorism and that somehow Muslim terrorism is unique. I think if we don't understand terrorism, then we will do what we've done in the UK, which is make the situation even worse. We started with young jihadi men, and now we have jihadi brides and jihadi families. Um, if we don't deal with this with the relevant understanding, then we will not be talking about importing terrorism as we have been. We'll be talking about exporting terrorism, which is happening from the UK already. So I think it's very, very important that we don't overstate the problem, but we try and understand the problem and we try to deal with it. Having said that, I'm going to go on to my presentation. Um, <clears throat> I looked at the, uh, the headings for this conference, Integration of Muslims in Europe, 
institutional frameworks and experiences and legal frameworks in Europe regarding migration. And I felt I needed to start with a clarification, at least, around the word migration. Because um, I think how we understand the word migration is a little bit different in Britain than how it's sometimes understood in Europe. Um, and hints of it were there in the presentation this morning. So for us, migrants um, are not just people um, who have arrived in the last uh, 20 years or 10 years or 15 years. Um, in fact, when we talk about integrating people, we don't really talk about migrants as such. We talk about more about uh, settled communities, minority communities. And the minority communities for us includes Jews, blacks, yes, Muslims, but Indians and other communities as well. So when we are talking about legal frameworks or institutional frameworks, we're not just talking about Muslims. And for us, this enterprise is much, much older in the UK. Um, <clears throat> the second point that I wanted to make um, is that when we are talking about minorities and integration of minorities, we are talking about at least two things. Um, we're talking about race and religion, not just religion. In fact, most of our legal and institutional frameworks are based on race. That's where it started. And it started um, possibly with the Jewish migration at the turn of the 20th century. But I think the real milestone for change was in the mid-60s with a very famous speech by the Home Secretary, then Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, who talked about integration not as a flattening process of assimilation, but equal opportunity accompanied by cultural diversity in an atmosphere of mutual difference or mutual tolerance. Um, and that's really important for us because what that does is, in no uncertain terms, it underlines this idea of integration as a two-way process. And what I will be talking about is more about the national response to integration, the government response to integration, the policy response to integration, rather than what we might demand from migrants in terms of integration. So I've looked at 10 possible frameworks, um, 10 possible pieces of legislation or initiatives, policy initiatives, that we've taken in the UK. And I'm just going to go through them very, very quickly um, and touch on the race elements of those provisions as well as the religion elements of those provisions and also say a little bit about where there may be parallels at the European level. So going back to Roy Jenkins, back in 66, there was the Race Relations Act. The Race Relations Act was then revamped in 1976. And this was a very, very critical, important critically important piece of legislation for us because it outlawed in the UK racial discrimination in employment and goods and delivery of facilities and services. The Race Relations Act extended to racial groups, so Muslims who fell into a racial group like Pakistanis or Bangladeshis were covered by this, but Muslims who did not fall into recognized racial groups were not covered by this. Um, they had to prove um, another indicator of race. And if it was on grounds of religion rather than race, they were not covered. So those gaps were later filled um, by a piece of regulation in 2003 called the Employment Equality, Race and Belief Regulations. And subsequently, so, but that only, employ, uh, that only filled a gap of employment. Later, another piece of uh, legislation in 2006 called the Equality Act 2006 filled the gap in terms of delivery of goods and services. And actually, the first piece of legislation in terms of religion came from the European directives, um, the first uh, directive being the race directive and the second directive being the employment directive, both um, in 2000. So that was the first legal and institutional framework in terms of protecting uh, minorities against discrimination on grounds of race 
with the hope that this would then encourage integration. Going back to Roy Jenkins. The second piece of legislation was the Public Order Act 1986, which outlawed incitement to racial hatred. So the first piece of legislation was a piece of civic legislation. This was a piece of criminal legislation, um, which said that you are not, not only are you not allowed to discriminate, but you're also not allowed to incite hatred or prejudice against minorities, which might then lead to um, either violence against minority communities or discrimination against minority communities. And this again, following the race model, was specific to race and was extended only in 2006 to include religion um, under the Racial and Religious Hatred Act 2006. And there's an equivalence of this, I think, at the European level in the shape of the framework decision on combating racism and xenophobia, which came into being in 2002. The third piece of legislation, which is important, is the Crime and Disorder Act of 1998. And what that did was to say that if an individual committed a criminal act towards a minority on the grounds that they are a minority, so if I hit somebody, then that's a crime. If I hit somebody because they're black, then that's what we call an aggravated crime. And what happens then is that the sentence is stiffer. It can be anything up to 10 years more because I'm hitting that person or I'm vandalizing their place of worship or their business, whatever it might be, because of their race or religion. Race initially from 1986 and subsequently from 2006, religion as well. The fourth piece of legislation which I think is a real game changer is the Race Relations Act of 2000. This comes in the wake of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, the Stephen Lawrence report, where we find that it's not enough just to say that if you do this, it's a crime. If you do this, it's a wrong in civil law. And the person who is hurt by this can then take the case to court. Because often we know those people are not in a position to be able to take those cases to court. So we reversed it. We put the burden on the state sector, public authorities in particular. Um, that they must monitor their employment practices, they must monitor their delivery of goods and services pro uh, um, um, provisions, they must monitor what impact what they do has in terms of race relations. And where they find there is a gap, there is a concern, they must take action with regards to that. So it's not just about compliance culture, as a company, yes, I've ticked these boxes and therefore I'm okay. It's about changing the culture of the workplace so that it is more inclusive of people of minority communities. It is more inclusive of their needs in terms of the services that are delivered by that public sector organization. And that the way it delivers those services does not create discord in society, but creates greater cohesion in society. And that was extended to religion. So initially in 2000, it was just race. In 2010, under the Equality Act, it was extended to religion. So you can see four pieces of legislation, what we might call the legal tools, four pieces of legislation, legal frameworks, which extend rights to people of minority communities, which protect them from discrimination. And the hope is, by protecting from this, uh, uh, them from discrimination, they are then better integrated into British society. I will just very quickly, I don't know how much time I've got, if I've got another five, six minutes. Yeah. I'll now just very quickly go through six other uh, frameworks or provisions in the UK which are not particularly legal but which we think helps to understand minority communities, the needs of minority communities, and therefore we are able to take measures <coughs> Uh, to integrate minority communities, both in terms of race, but also in terms of religion. And I don't think, bar from one or two, there are e European equivalents for these. If there are, then please let me know. There may be sort of individual national equivalents for this, German, uh, in Germany or in Spain or other countries. But I don't think there are EU frameworks for these. So the first one is the, the census, the national census. Every 10 years, we have a census. Uh, 2001, we had a national census. 2011, we had a national census. Um,
<clears throat> and for a long time, I don't know since when, we've had questions on race so that through the census, we have an understanding of our racial minority communities, whether the black communities, uh, Asian communities, Bengali communities, Pakistani communities, other Indian communities. We have an understanding of their employment um, status, how well they're doing in employment, how well they're doing in terms of education, how well they're doing in terms of housing, et cetera, et cetera, or how badly they're doing in terms of criminal justice. So through the census, we have some understanding of what's happening in society. The national census, which happens every 10 years, which is the whole population, is supplemented by a whole host of other surveys in the UK. The national was a much smaller sample you know, in the sort of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, not millions. Um, the national household survey, the British crime survey, um, the citizenship survey, which tell us a lot about different facets of life. Up until 2001, 2001, sorry, 2001, we collected statistics through these surveys on race. From 2001, we started doing it on religion. So now we have a much, much better understanding, not just in terms of how our Pakistani or Bangladeshi communities are doing, but how our Sikh communities are doing, Jewish communities are doing, Muslim communities are doing. We have it by race and by religion. That allows us to take action where there are deficits, where there are concerns. <coughs> I know that there is some movement at the EU level for data collection across the EU, but I think that's quite slow. It's still in the pipeline, and I'm not sure that it will be as strong as is required to get anything meaningful. The second thing that I wanted to mention is that for as long as I can remember, you know, even 30 years that I've been involved in policy work, there's always been a race equality unit at the heart of government. And from about 2004, 2005, we've had a faith communities unit, slightly different focus. Race equality unit is more to do with equality. Faith communities unit has more of an emphasis on good relations, on cohesion, not so much on equalities. But there's been a unit which is concerned about race groups. Now, I'm not sure that this happens. It may be a migration unit, but not in the same way as in the UK, with two things in particular. So the race equality unit at the heart of government has a race equality strategy, you know, which is looking at how we might improve the equality of life experiences of people of minority communities. And the second thing it does is that it makes grants to the voluntary sector to strengthen the capacity in those communities to be able to address some of their concerns, to be able to address their concerns at the level of policy making, whether it's at the local level or at the national level. And I think this is an important framework, important institutional um, setup in the UK. Supplemented or supplementing that, the race equality unit and the faith communities unit in government is the Commission for uh, Human Rights uh, and Equality, or Equality and Human Rights Commission. Previously, we had one specifically on race, uh, the Race Equality Commission, or the Commission for Racial Equality, CRE. Um, that has now been merged into uh, something much bigger, but still dealing with race equality, and now also faith equality from 2010. Um, and I don't think there's an equivalent. The, 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 the nearest thing that we come to uh, that at the European level is the Fundamental Rights Agency. But the Fundamental Rights Agency is essentially a promotion body, whereas the Commission for Equality and Human Rights and its predecessors, commissions like the Commission for Racial Equality, also have legal powers. They can take people to court. They can take departments to court. They can take individuals to court. They can take businesses to court. So those are not there, and there may be one or two other powers that are not there at the Fundamental Rights Agency that we have in the UK. The next thing that I want to talk about is the regime of, the, the inspectorate regimes. So in the UK, in the public sector in particular, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's criminal justice system, we have a very, very tight, and most European countries, I assume, would have that, um, tight regime of inspections. Now, what's happened in the UK, particularly since 
the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and the Stephen Lawrence report is that into the briefing of those inspectorates, in the heart of their work is this idea of race equality. So that's been sort of mainstreamed into their work. So when a inspectorate body in, uh, for the police or for the health service is doing an inspection on a certain authority, this is one of the things that they have to look out for, that there is race equality in terms of employment, in terms of delivery of goods and services, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think that's a very, very important part of the toolkit for race equality, equality of minorities in the UK, which help us move towards integration. Two final things, and I'll finish there. Um, public sector agreement targets. Um, so this has fallen by the wayside, but this was there almost throughout the whole of new labor. So from uh, 2000 to 2010, we had something called public sector agreement targets, which were led by the Treasury. The, these were targets set by the Treasury to different government departments. And one of the key things in setting those targets for the different government departments, whether it's the Home Office or whether it's the Ministry of Justice or whatever it might be, was this issue of race equality. As I say, that's fallen a little bit by the wayside now. But I think that was very, very important in terms of moving race equality, minority equality forward in the UK. And the very final thing, which I think does have some parallels at the European level, is this issue of procurement. So when government's putting out its work into the private sector, making sure that the private sector is delivering race equality as government would have done in delivering that work. There are a, a package of other things that I could mention, but they're much smaller. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we surely will come back to one of the, your points uh, in the discussions. So uh, I would like to give the floor now to Professor Hinghofer Zalki from Austria. Thank you very much. It's actually Salkai. <laughs> it's Hungarian. Oh, sorry. <laughs> doesn't, Salkai. doesn't matter that much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about legal governance of a new minority and why the Austrian example is actually so interesting. But first of all, I we'll like, like would like to talk a little bit about migration law, given that it is actually the name of the panel. Um, and would like to start that compared to the United Kingdom, which you've heard about quite a bit, um, EU migration is really not that much of a concern. So we can actually cross this off pretty quickly. And I would like to stress that asylum law in Austria, as in most of Europe, is actually thoroughly Europeanized and internationalized. And I will not go into the details for time reasons now, um, but one reason why I have to stress this is because recently both this asylum status and citizenship laws have been extremely tightened in Austria, and this will actually go on um, in the new government, most, uh, um, most certainly, and it would obviously be unconstitutional and a violation of European law to do special restrictions on Muslim migration only. So this is supposedly um, religion uh, blind to the faith of those seeking asylum and of those um, trying to come to Austria. But in, the reality is obviously somewhat different. And the Conservative Party, they tried to really balance this, so they only argued that we tried to really stem, as they call it, migration into the welfare state. Um, because as of recently, there is an absolute majority of aliens amongst those on basic welfare in Austria. So you see this, this is really a concern, but that's the Conservative Party. And the future coalition party is a different party, the Freedom Party to the extreme right, and they had lovely posters like these. Um, for example, here you read the Hamstadt Islam. The Ham means, it's a very colloquial Austri Austrian thing, staying for, uh, it's essentially, it essentially means home, homeland, um, you know, back home essentially. It's, it's hard to translate really, instead of Islam. So you really use us versus Islam, home versus alien. And this, these are actual campaign posters, not from this campaign though, and this is from this campaign where you have um, Mr. Kurz, who is most likely the future, uh, the future chancellor from the Conservative Party being quoted provocatively as Islam belongs to Austria. And, the, and of course the Freedom Party uses the opposite and they say Islamization has to be stopped. So actually they use Islam belongs to Austria as something against the Conservative Party, which will be their coalition partner, which makes things interesting. Um, and we have a different poster, which is also 
quite extreme, you might say, and you see also the Europeanization of these people because the other person you might know quite well, a Dutch gentleman. And in the background, you see a map of Austria being pierced by minarets, so obviously a, th a certain threat being um, transported here, and you see a, a, a fully veiled woman, and this is also obviously a threat to motivate voters. So you might think that there is now an extreme Islamophobia in Austria, but you might be surprised that Austria actually has a very, very old um, legal regime of integrating Muslims. And there's a general perception when you talk about Austria and Islam, many people immediately associate this with this, uh, the siege of Vienna or the sieges of Vienna. And this comes up both in very Islamist and also in right-wing discussions. But what is actually the key moment for Islam in Austria was 1878. Why 1878? Because Austria and Hungary at that point occupied Bosnia. And Bosnia, up to this point, used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, and many people in Bosnia had converted to Islam. And so there now was a substantial Muslim group living within uh, the borders, well, not yet the borders, but living under, under the de facto rule of Austria-Hungary, though Bosnia was not part of either Austria or Hungary, but jointly administered. But even immediately after the occupation, you saw a very a pragmatic approach. As early as 1881, there was a special legal regime for Muslims in the military, because very soon um, there was an attempt to get Bosnian Muslims to join the Austrian military, and there was quite some openness to accommodate their religious um, needs. Am I going too fast? Okay. Um, and in 1908, there was the actual annexation of Bosnia. Again, the annexation didn't happen to Austria proper, but to Austria-Hungary. Actually, um, under the joint financial ministry is a very peculiar situation that has to do with the fact that, a Hungary, uh, that Hungary claimed Bosnia as its own. However, because Bosnia was now part of Austria-Hungary, there was the anticipation of mass migration from Bosnia uh, to Vienna and to other parts of Austria. So there wasn't yet migration yet, or not a very high number of, mig of migrants in any case, but you can see the high pragmatism at that point because it was even discussed to establish Austrian Sharia schools. And, if you, and now we're 100 years later, and this is obviously a very touchy and even taboo subject, but at that time there was a very real, very real discussion of establishing Austrian Islam and there was no real fear of including Sharia. And the goal was really to integrate Bosnian Islam into the framework of religious governance provided for by the Austrian Constitution of 1867. And the relevant parts of which are still in force today. So how was this supposed to be done? The followers of the Hanafi rite, and that is interesting for various reasons, because what is the Hanafi school of Islam? The Hanafi school is a school of jurisprudence, of Islamic jurisprudence. But what Austria tried to do is to, in a way, translate this into Austrian legal thinking. And there it most closely corresponded to the idea of having a Hanafi rite. And it was thought to only incorporate the Hanafi rite because most people in Bosnia were actually Hanafi, and because it was also very much, um, the, system, uh, very much the, um, the interpretation of Islam, which was used by the Ottoman Empire, and was thought at the time to be very moderate and modern. And so this was an attempt to really exclude more radical um, branches or interpretations of Islam. But despite this, uh, this important um, in limitation, it was not intended to regulate Islam or to interfere in its structure or teachings, so it, it was not intended to create, in a sense, an Austrian Islam like it was done in, in, the, in the Russian Empire, where you, in a sense, try to dictate the content of a faith. So that was not, um, not the goal here. But the goal was really to give Islam equal rights as the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches before. This also meant allowing for Islamic religious foundations and especially important, allowing for the institutional uh, representation of the Hanafi, of Hanafi Islamic societies as public law corporations. And this is the model which we even have today, that we have actually Islamic societies as public, as corporations of Austrian public law. And again, think about this, this is 1912, a century ago. It was, however, of little importance originally. Why? Well, we all know what happened in 1914. 
and in 1918, the Austrian Empire was history. So migration from Bosnia didn't really occur as was planned. Um, on the contrary, there was some reversal of migration, and there weren't really many, um, uh, many Muslims in, in Austria after that. So the Islam Gesetz, in a way, was, I mean, it was still in the books, but it wasn't being implemented, it wasn't being used. This all changed in the 1960s. Why? Because there was a beginning of mass migration, um, and while the Austrian minority went from almost nothing to about 10% of the population, and up to 20% of young Austrians are now Muslims. So things changed pretty fast and pretty quickly, and the people coming to Austria were mostly from Turkish and Bosnian descent, which in a sense came in handy because those were mostly actually Hanafi, well, people following the Hanafi interpretation of Islam. This operationalization sorry, um, actually also tested this limitation to the Hanafi school um, of Islam because the actual um, uh, Islamic society said that this is, not an, uh, this is not a categorization which makes sense from an Islamic point of view. You cannot limit an Islamic society to only the Hanafi right, so to say, or Hanafi school of um, jurisprudence. And so this was actually overturned by the Austrian Constitutional Court as a violation of the Austrian Constitution as it would have interfered in the autonomy of Islam. Yeah, and this was in the, in the, in the 80s, so you see a step-by-step -step process. So if we have this old act from 1912, why have a new one from 2015, which was quite a bit discussed in, media, in, in the media? And one important point was the concern over foreign funding, because we had quite a bit of foreign funding from Saudi Arabia and other states. And there was a concern that um, especially Salafi Isla uh, interpretations of Islam were being promoted. And also there was a breakdown of the originally very, very good relation with the Turkish religious authorities because obviously Turkey has uh, moved into a different direction politically. And unfortunately, Islam, to some extent, is now being utilized as a tool of Turkish foreign policy. And so this was one of the reasons. And, well, I already mentioned this. And there was also a diversification of Muslim migration beyond the traditional countries of origin, Bosnia and Turkey, because migrants from Bosnia and Turkey very rarely knew, actually knew political and legal Islam. There was hardly any legal dimension of Islam in these legal structures, as both Bos Bosnia and Turkey were actually, legally speaking, secular. But this now changed, and interpretations of Islam now also changed. And one of the reactions was also the establishment of a state secretary for integration, originally placed with the Ministry of the Interior, and this was actually, uh, in a way, the, the brainchild of Mr. Kurt, um, who, in a sense, uh, really elevated this position to such an extent that he will now almost certainly be the next chancellor. You, so you see also the political importance of this issue in Austria. And there was, to some extent, also the attempt to create a moderate is, uh, to create some moderate Islam, but this obviously clashes with the very foundation of our. Um, well, our constitutional structure of autonomy, which also correlates to the autonomy of religions um, according to Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And, well, uh, today it was already mentioned that data can be one of the most important things. Well, data also plays quite a big role here because there is a change of Islam from being a new and tiny minority. When I was a child, it was still less than 1% actually of the Austrian population. But before 2050, according to current projections, Islam is most likely going to be the most prominent religion being followed in the city of Vienna, even before Roman Catholicism. So you see a very, very rapid change, which also called for actions. So what are the key provisions of this new Islam Act of 2015, which was quite contentious? First of all, and this is not really new, the recognition of Islamic religious communi uh, well, communities, their legal status and their rights, uh, including the right of assessment. Why the right of assessment? Because the Catholic Church has this right. And if the Catholic Church has this right, because of reasons of parity and equality, Islamic communities should enjoy it as well. And their role in providing religious services in special institutions, even prisons, including youth education. There was actually quite a bit of a scandal recently because um, the main re Islamic religious community in Austria, the IGGÖ, apparently provided some Salafi reading materials to prisons. 
Um, so this is obviously what we not intended with this act, but this also happened. Secondly, there was the studies of, Islam, of Islamic theologies, and there will be six new chairs of Islamic studies. Again, the idea of parity is important, because pro the Protestant church and also the Catholic, well, the Protestant churches, and the Catholic Church enjoy this, have enjoyed this for quite, a, for quite some time, and there are now more Muslims in Austria than Protestants. But there are two sides to this. On the one hand, there is the idea of parity and equality, and on the other hand, there is also this dimension or this idea that if we have church for Islamic studies, we have people who are competent to talk with the extremists and to actually reason with them people who actually know the sources of Islam really well and he, who actually can win an argument in their own language. So this was also one of the ideas behind this. There are also special provisions on dietary rules, holidays and graveyards that might be quite usual. Um, and you see there are always two paragraphs. Uh, this is not because it's repetitive, but for a very different reason. And this very different reason is the Alevi group. Because I've already mentioned that most um, uh, Muslim migrants to Austria um, come from Turkey, and Turkey is also home to a very big Alevi community, which wasn't really much institutionalized in Turkey, but was institutionalized in Austria. Because in Turkey itself, the state authorities for a long time tried to really, in a way, Sunnicize um, Alevi Islam. There's interesting case law by the European Court of Human, of Human Rights on this. But once in Austria, um, it was, while well, this community was on the one hand excluded from the mainstream Islamic community, on the other hand, they actually wanted to create their own institutions, and that was made possible by recognition in 2013. So we now have also different provisions for this community, including their own feast days. So the basic system was essentially upheld, and a section on the Alevi faith was added. Second component regulated differently for the Alevi faith. I think I mentioned this. And the recognition of the two main religious authorities, the IGGÖ and Alevi, has been reaffirmed. And the IGGÖ was originally thought to be one religious community for all Muslims in Austria. But especially because of the problems with the Alevi community, this failed. And currently there are discussions of elevating the Shia community in Austria to the same rank. And finally, the fourth part, which has been probably the most contentious issue, that basic financing for these communities now has to come from members in Austria. The idea, of course, being that, um, that those communities should not be dependent on radical um, Islamic endowments and also not on Turkish or Saudi or Qatari state institutions. This was the idea, but there are, there are still constructions to circumnavigate this, which is happening, actually, because um, the community in Austria is still highly dependent on Turkish uh, state structures, and they now have a leasing construction with Belgium. So Belgium actually hi um, theoretically hires them, and they're then leased um, within Europe. So there are some strange constructions to avoid this. And, there, and this has been called um, uh, discriminatory by many Muslim groups. And it is true, it is, it is something which you do not find on other religious communities, in, uh, well, in the regulations for other religious communities in Austria. So in this sense, there is actually a discrimination, but there are some, some reasons for this. Raising, of course, as I mentioned, the question of unequal treatment. What the Act of 2015 does, however, not prescribe, and this is very, very important and cannot be stressed enough, it does not prescribe how to understand or how to live Islam. Because very often it was thought that Austria has an Islam act, so we now actually have some sort of state Islam or try to push a certain interpretation of Islam. That is not true. What are the challenges remaining? Do we have still have time? Um, there are still st uh, strong differences between even Sunni Muslim groups because the main religious society is sometimes criticized as being far too conservative by moderate groups. And there are not recognized but registered religious communities, like the old Alevi community. So even the Alevi community is not as homogenous as one might think. There is the Shia community, which will pretty soon be recognized, it seems. And I also mentioned the Baha'i community, even though it is generally not considered to be part of Islam, because there's a certain uh, connection there. 
Now, the impact of the new chairs for Islamic studies is really hard to assess right now because it is new. It is hard to say whether it will actually transform Islam in Austria and whether this transformation will take the shape which was intended. And a key challenge remaining, of course, is this entire system was structurally built around religious experiences which we had with Christian churches. So, in a sense, this was projected onto Islam. Um, and there was, of course, the attempt to create parity and equality, but the structural thinking, and you see this in 1912 with the idea of a Hanafi right, doesn't make any sense in Islamic thinking, but there's always this projection of our models, our conceptions onto Islam. So this is a continuing problem. And there's a continuing unease over the jurisprudential dimension of Islam, which is in many countries very important. And there is a tendency to frame this jurisprudential um, uh, dimension as part of religious extremism. Uh, so I think you, already, you also made this to some extent, and, it's, it's, uh, and this is the way we tend to see it. Uh, but the problem is that for many Muslims, it does seem to be an important part of their faith. And I'm not trying to judge, I'm just saying that this is also something which we haven't really addressed yet, legally speaking. So is this a possible model for Europe? That's probably most important for most people here. First of all, our model is strongly tied to the Austrian model of religious government, uh, governance. There are most similarities with Germany, even though in Germany the system is more federalized, so the lender have a more important role. So even in Germany you couldn't use it as we do. The Austrian Act did serve as a possible role model in the German discussion, uh, though it was occasionally quite a bit misunderstood. I hope I could um, address this in this brief presentation. And it is obviously not possible in a, strict, in a system of strict re re uh, separation because um, there you could not grant a religious community the status of a public law corporation. Well, I will skip this part and, and simply go to my four key theses. Firstly, no Western legal system, and this includes Austria obviously, can impose Islam in a modern sense. And this is actually being done in some um, Islamic countries, well, some Muslim majority countries, like for example Tunisia. Tunisia actually defines Islam in a moderate sense in its constitution. But then again, Islam, uh, Tunisia is 98% Muslim, so there's also some legitimacy there if they do it based on a national compromise, whereas if it is imposed by majority non-Muslim um, uh, society, this, it doesn't have, enjoy the same level of legitimacy. Secondly, Islam in the context of immigration and integration law requires a, a serious study of its spiritual, social, and intellectual dimensions. And, uh, sir, you already mentioned that, um, that we should look at various systems of values, and I think we should also take Islam seriously um, and take the various schools of thought seriously and realize that even some of the interpretations of Islam which we might not like in Europe have some very good grounding in religious, um, in religious, uh, uh, well, how to put this, in religious philosophy, and we should engage this and respect it also as a different system of values, even Salafi Islam, which we might not like, which we, which we do not like to spread across Europe, but which, should, but which we should nonetheless respect as a system of values and as actually a strive to do something good. Thirdly, racializing Islam or Muslim contradicts both Western and Islamic values. It creates a certain sense of we and them, which I believe should be strongly avoided. And just to give two ex examples on how absurd this notion seems to be is that actually one of the most prominent thinkers of um, Islam and, uh, and politics of, um, of, the, of the last century was actually an Austrian um, born in Galicia, we discussed him, Mohammed Azad, um, who became a key thinker about the role of, um, of, Islam, uh, of politics in Islam and also of law in Islam. And on the other hand, we talked a lot, a lot about Northern Africans, but most people in Northern Africa were actually Christians before, uh, before their ancestors of Austrians were Christians. So racializing this makes absolutely no sense. Oops. And finally, I think we should really still rely on, the, on an open marketplace of ideas. I started with some pretty extreme campaign posters, and obviously most of us would really dislike them, 
they do obviously shock, offend, and disturb, but they also allow for an open discussion. And very often I've personally heard, well, you, we all know this, but you cannot say this. And that's a problem, because if stereotypes get not, do not get openly discussed, then we cannot address them. So in my opinion, even though we obviously have to act against hate speech, which has no content um, in this discussion, we should tr still try to keep an open dialogue because even most radical Islamists, well, all radical Islamists and all those in the extreme right are still human beings and we can still reach them with human reasoning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hinghofer Stalkai, for this very interesting uh, presentation about the experience of Austria. I think this is an interesting point for reference. Now I will pass the floor. Ah, see. This is Mixon Gratin Stuhl. Ah, see. Yeah, yeah. Can you come here? Ah, yeah, of course. Yeah, because then you can see better what they see. Yeah, yeah. See, see, see. Is it? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Buenos días. Eh, muchísimas gracias por estar todos aquí. Muchísimas gracias, antes que nada, a Casa Árabe por la invitación. Es un placer siempre estar en, en este foro, eh, en esta mesa y compartir eh, un poco de lo que una sabe con, con la gente que viene a escucharla. Eh, cuando me plantearon venir a, a dar esta ponencia, eh, me insistieron en que tendríamos que centrarnos en la cuestión de los musulmanes en España. Y yo pensaba que no era necesario eh, darles unas nociones básicas o iniciar mi intervención diferenciando entre extranjería y musulmán. Sin embargo, me veo en la tesitura de que creo que sí que va a ser necesario, porque estamos hablando todo el rato sobre migración. Y migración es un concepto muy amplio y la extranjería también es un ámbito muy amplio. Pero en este momento tenemos que centrarnos en la comunidad musulmana, que es el momento de nuestra ponencia, musulmanes en España. Entonces, no voy a hablarles de la extranjería, no voy a hablarles de los centros de internamiento de extranjeros, no voy a hablarles de los procesos de regularización ni tampoco de los interminables eh, y agotables años para la adquisición de la nacionalidad. Para un momento. Eh, no, no hay interpretación en este momento. ¿Eh? Ah, sí. Ahora funciona. ¿Ahora sí? Sí, sí funciona. Vale. Vale, continuo. Tampoco voy a hablar de los menores extranjeros no acompañados. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, uh, she's only said all the things she's not going to talk about. Uh, we are only going to talk about the Muslim uh, community in Spain. Uh, the uh, percentage uh, of uh, uh, immigrants uh, who are really Muslims. I say this uh, because in uh, many, because many uh, countries uh, the immigrants uh, come from uh, are Muslim countries, but not not all their nationals are Muslims. So uh, I think this is another aspect uh, to uh, bear in mind. So uh, I'm going to give a few basic uh, facts and uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm not going to say that there are 9 million Muslims in Spain because this is not true. It's 1.9, nearly 2 million, but not 8 nor 9 million. Uh, there are 8 or 9 million foreigners uh, coming from Muslim countries, uh, but they're not all Muslims. Uh, so these statistical uh, data are the official uh, statistics about uh, the uh, Muslims' residents in Spain. Uh, well, uh, here we can see that in Spain uh, there are 
two million, around two million Muslims, and 42% of them are Spaniards. But when we say Spaniards, we have to uh, differentiate. Are they Spaniards because they have converted to Islam, or are they Spaniards uh, because they are uh, the so-called uh, second uh, generation, or are they uh, Spaniards uh, because they have acquired the Spanish nationality? Well, uh, all these differences are important because it's not the same. Uh, so uh, f more than half of the Spanish Muslims are, uh, are uh, second or third generations of uh, Muslims. Uh, so uh, these uh, uh, data uh, go uh, back to simply either their names or uh, to the certainty that they uh, profess the Muslim religion. And uh, seven out of ten are Moroccans or from the north of Africa in general. Uh, then there is a small percentage uh, of uh, citizens from Pakistan, from Algiers, uh, because uh, it is also important to underline this, because we do not have uh, citizens from uh, Arab countries like Qatar or Saudi uh, Arabia, etc. Uh, nearly all these Muslims in Spain uh, are concentrated in Catalonia. Uh, more than 500,000 of them uh, reside in uh, Catalonia, then 200,000 in Andalusia, 180,000 in Madrid, and uh, 200,000 approximately in Valencia. And the uh, other extreme of the Spanish map, uh, we have the north of Spain, Cantabria and Asturias, with the smallest uh, number, probably because it's very cold, uh, 10,000 approximately. As you can see in this uh, image here, we've got the Spanish uh, map. Uh, and uh, I have uh, tried to reflect all this data graphically. Ceuta and Melilla, a very important uh, uh, group, uh, which makes sense uh, because uh, these are the two Spanish cities on the uh, African continent. And uh, then uh, further up there, the uh, different nationalities, uh, the Spaniards in the first place. I've just explained uh, that uh, they are uh, uh, not uh, the Spaniards converted to Islam, uh, but that it's basically the second and third generations. And then uh, from uh, Pakistan, from Mali, from Bangladesh, from Guinea, etc. Uh, these, uh, of course, are uh, the uh, persons who uh, take longest uh, to become Spanish citizens. It takes them about uh, 10 years. Uh, then also the ones who come from Ceuta and Melilla. And there, a little further in the back, uh, the uh, so-called Muslim uh, students, I'm going to talk about that a bit later, uh, when I talk about the, uh, the constitutional rights of the Muslim community in Spain in accordance with the law of uh, religious freedoms, so, but here there are some rights that are not being respected. Now let's uh, start. As I'm a lawyer, I'm going to talk about uh, pieces of legislation, the Spanish constitution the Carta Magna, we are talking about so much uh, these years, uh, Article 155 uh, with, re with regard to Catalonia. Well, Article uh, 9, and it says the public, uh, the state uh, has to uh, take all necessary measures to grant that uh, the rights uh, of uh, all the Spanish citizens are real and are being implemented. Um, they are obliged to eliminate the barriers uh, that uh, stop them from fully uh, exerting uh, these uh, political, co social, and cultural rights. Uh, well, political rights. I'm not sure how many Muslims uh, are part of our political system, uh, members of parliament, uh, ministers. Well, France is a very good uh, example there. Hopefully, one day we'll have a Muslim minister. Article number 14 of the Constitution.
situation uh, the Spaniards are equal uh, with regard to the law uh, there can't be any discrimination uh, due to uh, race religion sex or no other social or personal uh, reason this means uh, that we are all equal uh, there should be no uh, discrimination whatsoever uh, with regard to our rights and yet it uh, wouldn't uh, there are not few cases uh, of uh, discrimination uh, with regard uh, to the access to the uh, uh, right uh, to work if you want to be a civil servant in Spain you need to have the Spanish nationality for example uh, there are certainly uh, not always uh, the right to, to uh, the freedom of uh, expression um, and uh, uh, the uh, religious freedoms uh, women with uh, wearing a yihab uh, um, cannot uh, work uh, in, in lots of uh, working places, or Article 16 of our Constitution uh, grants uh, religious, ideological, and uh, uh, freedom of uh, uh, speech to everybody. Well, uh, the uh, religious uh, freedom in a, in a non-religious state like Spain uh, uh, should also um, make sure that all religions uh, have uh, the right to the same uh, funding by the state. Uh, so uh, in accordance with the percentage uh, of uh, their followers, so with two million Muslims uh, in Spain, uh, this uh, should mean uh, an entitlement uh, to an endowment of the uh, Muslim religion, and this certainly does not, uh, is not uh, being uh, respected. Uh, where are the, uh, the mosques in Spain? Well, in uh, uh, in industrial suburbs, uh, in totally inadequate quarters, uh, and uh, this uh, is one of the reasons why uh, the radicalization uh, is uh, increasing, uh, why we have these uh, imams uh, that uh, um, teach a totally radicalized uh, version uh, of uh, Islam. Uh, and uh, the uh, consequences are well known and uh, we are seeing these terrorist attacks now in Spain um, having been uh, uh, initiated in, in these uh, sort of areas of the suburbs of Spain. And uh, well, there are several different uh, versions uh, of Islam. Well, and, uh, um, then there are two other important aspects. The uh, positive uh, recognition of rights. What does that mean? Uh, this means uh, that uh, every uh, individual and every community uh, is uh, entitled uh, to uh, uh, be part of a religious community uh, or uh, stop uh, being so, can uh, uh, abandon uh, a certain uh, confession. There can never be any prosecution uh, related to either of these two movements. But it uh, also uh, entitles uh, every Spanish uh, resident uh, to uh, live uh, the, the cult uh, freely, to uh, uh, receive information, religious information of all uh, types, the right uh, to uh, associate, to meet, uh, to participate uh, in uh, religious uh, events. And uh, then uh, there is uh, also is the, uh, the role of the uh, public uh, powers, the uh, religious freedom uh, also uh, implies uh, the uh, freedom of the different uh, confessions uh, in Spain, uh, uh, the, uh, also the two uh, different uh, Pero tenemos esas dos, esas las comunidades versions uh, of the uh, Muslim faith in Spain, uh, very often uh, uh, with conflicts uh, among themselves. Uh, also, the uh, Muslim communities are granted uh, internal uh, autonomy. Uh, there cannot be any type uh, of inspection. Um, they have the right to create 
uh, their own. Yeah, only five minutes left. We haven't had this presentation, and she's speaking very fast, so I'm very sorry if we can't really translate everything. Then there are the uh, cooperation uh, agreements uh, from the year uh, 1992, uh, agreements uh, that are not being fulfilled at all. And here we have the difference between individual and collective rights. Among the individual rights, uh, there's the right to uh, the uh, weddings uh, in accordance with the Islamic rights. And uh, 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 they, uh, they also have the uh, right uh, to celebrate uh, the marriages in public uh, spaces, even uh, if they are in prison. They have the rights to call for an uh, imam in the same way as a Catholic uh, prisoner uh, can uh, has the right to have his wedding officiated by a Catholic uh, uh, priest. And uh, uh, then uh, in the uh, workers' uh, statute, uh, they have uh, the right uh, to uh, celebrate, to have a free day on uh, Friday uh, uh, within the uh, Islamic uh, uh, faith. Uh, then also the rights, certain rights, workers' rights uh, during uh, Ramadan. Uh, so these are workers' rights that nobody really is aware of. And uh, many Muslims uh, who live and work in Spain uh, are not aware of these rights too, or if they are aware, uh, they are very reluctant to claim them because they are then afraid of being laid off. Uh, so uh, the state uh, uh, grabs these rights, but they are uh, in practice uh, not being enforced nor claimed. For example, the students, the university students, uh, uh, if they are uh, convened to an exam uh, on a Muslim holiday, theoretically they've got the right to refuse and to have that exam being uh, changed to another more convenient date. Again, rights that are not being neither uh, enforced nor, uh, nor claimed. So in order to go a little bit faster and to focus on uh, what I really wanted to say, I'll now start talking about education. The agreements uh, from 1992 uh, granted religious, uh, the freedom of religious education, uh, so uh, the uh, Muslim uh, parents could go to a Spanish school and claim uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, teachings. Uh, but uh, what is uh, the reality? There are just uh, very few Muslim teachers for, uh, for hundreds and thousands of uh, Muslim students, so it's uh, just not practical and not viable in practice. Here we have the students, uh, uh, 82,000 in, uh, in Catalonia, 46,000 in Andalusia. Uh, so, uh, and uh, here, are the, here are the numbers of the teachers that we have, uh, 55 teachers of Muslim religion for all these students. So uh, 22 of them teach in Andalusia, 14 in Ceuta, 10 in Melilla, 3 in Aragon and uh, in the Basque country. And in Catalonia, the community with the by far largest number of uh, Muslim citizens, there's not one uh, religion uh, teacher, at least none who is uh, officially authorized to do so, which means that the religious uh, education uh, for all these uh, thousands uh, of uh, young Muslims uh, comes through other channels, uh, certainly not the officially approved ones. Another very uh, important uh, right is the right to uh, a dignified death. And uh, when I say that, uh, that, that means uh, that um, when uh, a relative uh, dies, uh, he is entitled to be buried in Spain and uh, that uh, we don't have to uh, start uh, asking uh, the whole of our family uh, for money in order to be able to, uh, to uh, transport uh, the body to the country of origin. Um, well, there are these uh, problems we've had. Uh, 
uh, around uh, uh, graveyards, um, and uh, then uh, there is the uh, uh, custom uh, of or the right of the, uh, the Islam right uh, of uh, burying uh, the uh, dead uh, just uh, wrapped in some cloths and not in a coffin. Uh, so uh, there was a clash between uh, our Spanish. Uh, 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 rights and uh, Spanish uh, legislation. Uh, there is this uh, uh, regulation, uh, health-based uh, uh, regulation, uh, which uh, forbids uh, the burials uh, without a coffin for uh, health uh, reasons. So, uh, so the uh, agreement uh, that we have with the Muslim uh, community uh, is uh, a hierarchical, uh, is, is, uh, is a law, a piece of legislation of a higher legal uh, status uh, than these um, health uh, and sanitation uh, regulations. Uh, so uh, it uh, should be uh, respected, and yet uh, in practice this uh, doesn't happen. What do I want to say with all this? Uh, that we uh, don't uh, really have graveyards uh, for uh, the uh, Muslims, which is uh, uh, such an important aspect for a religion. Here we see a map of, uh, of uh, the 24 graveyards. We have very few teachers, but even fewer graveyards uh, that uh, Muslims uh, can uh, use. And well, coming to to the end. Uh, well, a conclusion. There is no real conclusion I can draw. Of course, there are so many things I didn't have time to uh, talk about, uh, like uh, anything to uh, do with food, halal uh, food, uh, the hate speeches, the uh, Islamophobia, uh, gender Islamophobia. Uh, but this afternoon, I think there is another round table discussion where we'll have uh, the opportunity of uh, talking about all this. Well, thank you so much.